So this is how you do it in Australia. <laughs> you get the pom over. <laughs> You, you, wait, you wait until he's maximally jet-lagged, and then you give him a, uh, a format of talking that he's never done before. And you remove me from my lectern and my PowerPoint. I, I'm well out of my... And I have to follow Peter Gibson as well. So what I did, admittedly, in my business class seat, was I watched about 10 TED Talks on the way over. So I, I know a little bit about this. I know how to spot a narcissistic personality disorder. <laughs> and I know, I know how to make somebody fall in love with me. That might come in time. <laughs> so, here we go, engaging with the eosinophil. Now, if I could be reborn as a PhD student, I would work here. Meet in Adelaide in a couple of days, and uh, Colin Sanderson, both Aussies, working in London, at the time that these growth factors, these cytokines that fuel type 2 immunity were discovered. They were mouse immunologists and they did lovely work and I think incredibly painstaking work. This was hard graft. Um, but Angel discovered IL-5. He discovered a factor that promoted the growth of eosinophil specifically but also activated eosinophils very dramatically, I think you'll agree, uh, whilst having no effect on uh, neutrophils. And this team and others around the world um, in the mid-80s to the early 90s, so about 25 years before the drug appeared, uh, uh, Gary, um, they constructed the type 2 immunity tube map, I think, uh, as Andy Bush likes to call it, this tube map that you're all familiar with. And when you've got the protein, it's relatively straightforward to inhibit it with monoclonal antibodies. And we have um, tools that can inhibit this process, particularly IL-5 targeted monoclonal antibodies, IL-5 receptor targeted monoclonal antibodies, um, and IL-4 receptor alpha targeted monoclonal antibodies that are taking out both IL-4 and IL-13. So what we can in effect do with these drugs is create IL-5 knockout humans. And there are many thousands of IL-5 knockout humans walking around at the moment. And one remarkable thing is that you can take this process out and there are no important adverse effects. So th this immune pathway is to some extent an immune appendix. It doesn't seem to be that important for normal, healthy life. Um, so what have we learned from creating human knockouts? It was a striking failure. This trial used the model of drug discovery that was so successful for long-acting bronchodilators, and we saw that with uh, the Greg's earlier talk, you know, the succession of very important trials, Ann Wilcox's trial, Greening and Inns trial. But the same trial, so patients with asthma, that is bronchodilator responsive airflow obstruction, looking at a measure of airway caliber or associated symptoms, there was no efficacy of mepolizumab. There's an interesting story about this study because Roland Boole, who's a good friend of mine, he had a friend who was an ophthalmic surgeon who participated in this trial. And his friend had nasal polyps, uh, severe asthma with recurrent exacerbations. And whatever he was randomized <laughs> to in this trial was a game changer. He had never felt so well. <laughs> Only for Roland to say, the drug doesn't work. <laughs> They're pulling it. There's no further development. So what was this guy to do, this ophthalmic surgeon, for the first time in 10 years? I can breathe. I can smell. I can drink alcohol. I can enjoy it. I can operate. What, <laughs> what do I do? So, so he sued GSK. He sued them and managed to get a supply of treatment. A top tip to GSK. If patients are suing you, You've probably got a drug. <laughs> anyway, 
Anyway, uh, when we did a different sort of clinical trial, and I'm going to talk uh, in, a, in a little while if I've got time. Where's my timer? Oh, we're all right. Uh, ab about the thinking that led to this. So when we did a study in people with ear eosinophilic airways disease, so the only thing we were really concerned about was these patients had to have eosinophilic airway inflammation, and we used the induced sputum technique that Peter Gibson had developed in Canada um, to confirm they had this treatable trait, and we wanted them to have a clinical problem that we thought was associated with eosinophilic airway inflammation. Now, clearly, um, morning peak expiratory flow wasn't going to cut the mustard, so it had to be something different, uh, and we chose exacerbations, and I'll explain why in a minute. And when we did that, the drug worked very well. We had more ophthalmic surgeons in this study than, <laughs> than this study. Um, and the, uh, the rest is history. This drug is now um, changing people's lives. So it's been a huge, huge uh, pleasure to be involved in the development of this, uh, this drug. So how did we come to this uh, realisation? I think there were, <laughs> it was me, Peter and John Farhey. Do you remember? I think we were the only people in the world that believed that this was the right paradigm at one point. And we used to get talks on Wednesday afternoon at the ERS and there were two men and a dog there. <laughs> and we used to go and have a beer afterwards to console each other. And I remember saying to Peter, and I had a great deal of respect for Peter. I've lost it slightly because he did have <laughs> notes. He did have notes, I noticed. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I do remember saying to P Peter in the, uh, the mid-90s or late-90s, I think around the time we were hearing about these negative studies, uh, we are right, aren't we? Yeah, he said, we're definitely right. <laughs> we're de and it was enormously important to have that, that support, yes. So the paradigm that we came up with was that uh, we really had two independent treatable traits in airways disease um, that related to different outcomes. So... Uh, Eosinophilic airway inflammation clearly linked uh, to exacerbations of airways disease um, and abnormality of airway function. And I don't think it really matters whether that's airway hyperresponsiveness or fixed airflow obstruction or cough reflex hypersensitivity. Whatever the abnormality of function, it's uh, what's driving symptoms. And clearly labbers are very good at dealing with this and uh, the associated symptoms. Um, but if you're targeting this process, um, you don't want to pa select patients on the basis of possession of this. It's a bit like doing a blood pressure trial and requiring the patient to have diabetes to get into it. It's, it's just not a rational thing to do. I mean, you might get outcomes, I suppose, but uh, it's not rational. So, um, and this... Uh, model allows you to make predictions and that's what we do in science we build a model and say to what extent does this account for what we've seen already and what does it allow us to predict in the future and the big way to test this model was of course uh, to intervene with mepolizumab and if we were right we would have an effect on this outcome not much effect on these outcomes and that's exactly what was found as we get better at identifying this trait, and we've got better biomarkers, so like the oxygen um, sensor, you know, the blood eosinophil count's not bad, it's not perfect, I completely agree. Um, we're getting a purer response to treatment. In fact, sputum eosinophils, I'm sorry to say, wasn't a particularly good way of identifying patients suitable for mepolizumab. Blood eosinophils are very good. So we've started to see more clear evidence of benefit, and we're getting more ophthalmic surgeons treated with this drug than <laughs> we were before. So, uh, yes, yeah, so this, this is the model, and it allows you <laughs> to make other predictions, which is that there is always going to be a limit to um, a management approach, as Gina still does, that focuses almost exclusively on symptoms and airway dysfunction as uh, your treatment target. And we will have to incorporate assessment of this trait using biomarkers in order to get to the next level. And I think that's the most important message that comes out of this. This thinking allowed us to get biologics over the line, but really it's very relevant to day-to-day -day practice of airways disease in non-specialist care. So we've got to get this out into primary care 
in the way that the cardiologists got cardiovascular risk reduction out into primary care uh, 20 years ago. And what have they achieved? I mean, it's remarkable what they've achieved. Since 2005, um, there has been a 70% reduction in mortality from ischemic heart disease in men in the UK. That's incredible. It is incredible. And that, is, that has been delivered by primary care-based, biomarker-based risk stratification. If I go to my GP with an ingrowing toenail, I have six biomarkers of cardiovascular risk assessed without anyone asking me if I want them assessed. And I'm told that if I take the following five treatments, my risk of a heart attack will be reduced by 3% over the next 10 years, and I do that. If I go to my GP with asthma, I'm lucky if I get my lung function measured. <laughs> That's only going to tell you so much. Certainly, they'll ask me about symptoms. Again, that'll only tell me so much. There's no attempt made to assess this key uh, process which drives a very important outcome. So we now understand how eosinophilic airway inflammation causes exacerbations. What are exacerbations? They are episodes of non-bronchodilator responsive airflow limitation. That's why the patient's in trouble. If they respond to Ventolin, I have no problem. I'll get on with my life. But if I don't, I need help. So there are episodes of non-bronchodilator responsive airflow limitation. John Fahey, one of the, the three people that had beers on Wednesday afternoon at various international meetings, has done this beautiful study using CT, I think a blunt tool, to assess mucus plugging and giving it a score from 0 to 20 and showing very nicely that... Uh, the mucus plug score correlates with sputum eosinophils, but also with impaired post bronchodilator lung function. And showed beautifully that it's eosinophil peroxidase that oxidizes sulfahydryl groups on mucin, MUC5 particularly, causing uh, the formation of hard, sticky plugs. Um, these plugs are full of crystals, charcoal laden crystals. These crystals are now known to actually drive type 2 immunity. So there's uh, increasing evidence that they are driving it. And the mucus plug with crystals is an almost perfect way of immobilizing worms within the airway. And that's probably what this process is there for, not something that we have great need. So, this mechanism is very important in driving exacerbations of asthma and COPD. It can be detected very easily using biomarkers. Um, let's start doing it. Let's start uh, offering biomarker-directed precision medicine. Let's tell the patient what asthma they have. Let's stop saying you have asthma. Let's say this is the asthma you have. You have mild symptoms, you have high risk. You have low risk, you have high symptoms. Individualize, individualize our approach. Thank you.